Hi, everybody. This is pa this is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 10 and Revelation chapter 11. This is a pause between uh, the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. So once again, God is showing his grace to the world by giving everyone a chance to repent. But you know what? His patience is running out at this point. And once that seventh trumpet sounds... There's no more grace, no more mercy left. Someone asked John Cardos to open up in prayer tonight. John, would you open in prayer, please? And don't forget to unmute. What happened? He got, he left. Okay. Well, he'll be back later. Okay, Steve, would you open up in prayer, please? Dear Father, thank you for gathering us today to hear your word, to learn more about the book of Revelation. Thank you, Father, for the message that you have prepared for us. Father, I pray that we increase the knowledge of who you are, the knowledge of what is coming in the future. I pray that you bless everyone that will listen to this teaching today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thank you very much, Steve. Let me just let Cardos back in. All right. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, animations, one of Revelation chapter 10, and then it'll be followed by an animation of Revelation chapter 11. So we can get a good idea, a visual idea of what we're dealing with tonight. So here we go. Here's Revelation chapter 10. Enjoy. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Okay, that's Revelation chapter 10. The animations are so cool. I really like them very much. But can you imagine being John and seeing those things with your own eyes? Wow. All right, now here's chapter 11 of Revelation in an animation. And I hope you enjoy this one as much as the last one. Here we go. Revelation chapter 11.
And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and an half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Okie dokie, that's Revelation chapter 11. And now we're going to break it down bit by bit. So here we go with chapter 10. Let me just set it up for you and then we'll get started. Here we go. Revelation 10. And I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And here's an artist's depiction of, the, of that particular angel. This is a pretty good depiction, I think. Nice illustration. All right, now some people believe that this is an appearance of Jesus because he has a couple of characteristics that are similar to the Lord, such as his face shining like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. But although Jesus is referred to as an angel of the Lord on occasion in the Old Testament, I want to point out to you that he is never referred to as an angel in the New Testament. Why? Because by this time it's been revealed to us that he is God's only begotten son, God in the flesh, the Lord and Savior of the world. Now, the fact that the angel's feet are planted on the land and the sea uh, tells us that he must be enormous in size, absolutely huge and that the planting of the feet indicates an act of ownership on behalf of the Lord. After all, God owns all the land and seas, and he has a right to execute judgment 
on the land and the sea as he sees fit, and judgment is coming. And so this angel is claiming, uh, claiming God's ownership over everything. Now, since this event happens during the tribulation, it packs a punch, because by this time, the Antichrist, who is inspired by Satan and who has started a new world order, has laid claim to the land and the seas as Lord of all. He distinguishes himself as Lord of all, and eventually he'll distinguish himself as a god. But God begs to differ. So this breaks up the topic of angels altogether. I thought it would be interesting to just talk about angels for a little while. Now, they all serve different roles in the administration of God's kingdom. And I saw that there are several different roles that angels fulfill. First of all, there are commissioned angels, such as when Gabriel was sent to proclaim the birth of Jesus to Mary. He received a commission to make that great announcement. Then there are judgment angels, such as those two who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And there are also those angels who blow the seven trumpets and pour out the seven bowls of God's judgment. So obviously angels participate in judgment and in some cases bring it about themselves. Then there are warring angels who make up the supernatural army of the Lord and they are headed by the archangel Michael. The archangel Michael is the leader, the captain of the armies of the Lord. Then there are adoring angels whose whole purpose is to worship the Lord continually, like the four living creatures in the earlier chapters. And of course, some of the seraphim that never stop crying out, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. Now, I'm not sure if these are specific designations given to particular angels or that any one of them can be used in any one of these functions. Last but not least, angels serve Christians, as mentioned in Hebrews chapter 1, which we're going to look at in a minute. But we have to be careful that we biblically uh, stay, to the, stay accurate about angels and, and portray biblically an, uh, accurate angels. And there are uh, here are the classes of angels found in the scriptures. First of all, there are cherubim, and then we have seraphim who have six wings, two cover their faces, two cover their bodies, and with two they fly. Then we have the living creatures that we read about in Revelation 5 and 6. Then we have the angel Gabriel, who is an archangel, uh, the, uh, the archangel Michael, and then Lucifer, who was also an archangel, who was the cherub who covered, and some say the worship leader of heaven before he fell. And then there are fallen angels. That's all the scripture says about angels and who they are, what class classification of angels there are. Anything more than that is speculative, and it opens the door to the occult. But the one thing that's important is that we have to know that Jesus is greater than any angel. He is not an angel. He is the master of all angels. And that's depicted in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 14. So let me read it for you. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him like a father and he shall be to me like a son. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let, angel, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloth, or like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years shall not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So we see here in this verse that angels serve the people of God. So in this passage, we see that Jesus is infinitely higher than the angels, as he is infinitely higher than the angel of Revelation chapter 10. But the one thing about angels is that when people see them, they're really spectacular beings, massive beings, glorious beings, reflecting the glory of God. So it's no wonder that those who see them are compelled to fall down and worship them. But real angels, angels of the Lord, not fallen angels, always refuse worship. Just remember that real angels, true angels, servants of the Lord will always refuse worship. Let's continue in the book of Revelation. And when this angel cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. 
And now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them down. So I assume that these seven thunders came from the throne of God. Now, where do I get that from? Well, I get it from Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. From the throne, that is the throne of God, proceeded lightnings, thunderings, there's the thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, there are not seven spirits of God, but seven is the perfect number of God. And it's just another way of describing the Holy Spirit. Now, these thunderings, spoke something that we are not supposed to know. That's why John was not allowed to write it down. And that tells me that God only reveals what we need to know, which is a lot, but some things he wants to keep to himself. And it's not the first time that the Lord has forbidden his servants to reveal the secrets. I can think of a couple of examples in particular, which I wrote down. One comes from Daniel chapter 12, beginning at verse 8. Listen to what it says. Although I heard, Daniel says, I did not understand. And then I said, Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And then another instance came to my memory, which was in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 3 and 4. This is Paul talking about his experience in heaven, where he says, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up in paradise and heard, look at this, inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And that's because the Lord would not let him describe the kingdom of God. But of course, he showed the kingdom of God to John, and he describes it. So what are some of the important things that God has revealed to us that were previously uh, previously hidden in uh, ancient times. What are some of the things that the Lord has revealed to us that are wonderful to know right now? Steve, what does the Lord reveal to us that was hidden before? Uh, <clears throat> Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of I glory. Believe, uh, uh, the mystery that was hidden from ages and generations is now made manifest to his saints. Okay. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So Christ in us, the hope of glory. Okay, what about you, John? What does the Lord reveal to us now that previously was hidden? Well, he, he has revealed that uh, that the tabernacle that they they attended in the wilderness and did many things uh, in the pre the, the priesthood and the blood of uh, the blood of the sacrifice. Today we know that speaks of Jesus. Ah. Okay, so that's a good mystery that's been revealed. Okay, I like that. What about you, Vivian? What has the Lord shown us today that was hidden before in the Old Testament? I'm thinking about Jesus. Okay, what about him? Um. Well, again, the Bible of uh, in Isaiah in the Old Testament talk about Jesus, so it's yeah. not really revealed now. No, but, but it wasn't wasn't clear though. It wasn't really clear. I mean, it, the the Old Testament did talk about Jesus. That's true, but still, the Jews didn't believe in him when he came, and it wasn't really clear about who he was. But in the New Testament, then, it is clear. The second coming of Jesus. Oh, okay, the second coming of Jesus. That's a good one. What about you, Oliver? What has been revealed to us that was hidden before? I'm I'm waiting for a particular answer. Let's see if somebody gets it. The salvation, the way to salvation. Ah, That's there it, it is. Oliver does it. Okay, tell us, tell us about it, Oliver. What about Oliver, salvation? By um, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Initially repenting of our sin. Right. And trusting in Jesus, and then for the repentance and continuing to hold on till the end. Okay, Elise, what did Jesus do in that we can trust Him for forgiveness of sins? That was not revealed before, but it's revealed now. Well, he died on the cross to gain ah. everything, but also eternal life was to be my answer. They didn't realize back then that we had eternal life through Jesus' sacrifice. That's a good one. And there's one other thing that he revealed that I'm going to tell you about. Well, I'll tell you about it now, I guess. And that is that there's a separation between Israel and Gentiles, but in Christ, the two are brought together. And yet they're still separate. The church has not replaced Israel. 
Israel does not replace the church. There are separate promises for Israel, separate promises for Gentiles that get saved under the blood of Jesus, but together they make up one church. They are two separate entities that make up one church. That's another thing that's revealed to us now that was not revealed to us before. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Let's go back to Revelation, okay? All right. Verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should no longer be a delay. So we now know for certain that this is not Jesus. This is not, this angel is not Jesus because why? Well, he's praising the Lord who lives forever and ever and who created all things. So it can't be Jesus. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. So at the seventh trumpet, this is what this verse means. God's grace will have reached his end. Let me just put in the D here. Because I have to keep these notes for posterity. There we go. So at the seventh trumpet, the grace of God runs out. It's all judgment now. No more breaks. No more pauses so people might be saved. As soon as the seventh trumpet sounds, everything will unfold until the kingdom of God is fully established. And although that's true, there is still one more pause before the sound of the seventh trumpet because God is merciful. And even in that late stage, he's still merciful towards the earth, giving people a time to repent because as we found out, some people do repent. Now, the mysteries of God are not unsolvable puzzles, but they're revelations revealed to us that have been previously withheld. And we discussed some of those just a few moments ago. Uh, they may not be fully comprehended, but at least we know about them. So let's go through some of the mysteries of God. And there are three in particular that really interest me. And that is the mystery of sin, the mystery of godliness, and the mystery of our resurrection. So I picked out some scripture verses to talk about each. Let's talk about, first of all, the mystery of sin. In 2 Thessalonians 2.7, it says, For the mystery of iniquity, or sin, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken away, taken out of the way. So my question is, who is restraining sin unfolding completely in the world? John? That's the Holy Spirit. Okay, and Jamie, how do you think the Holy Spirit's going to be removed from the earth? Because it says that he who restrains sins will be removed, taken out of the way. So how is he going to be taken out of the way, Jamie? Uh-huh. When there is no more sin. Okay, that's close. When the, the, He's got to be taken out of the way so sin can unfold on the oh, earth. Oh, so sin can unfold. When is that going to happen? Is that, yeah. I'm sorry, what did you ask? When? So when is the Holy Spirit going to be taken out of the earth, his influence? I would say at the resurrection. At the resurrection, okay. Anybody else? John? The rapture. That's what the I rapture. think. That's what I meant, sorry. <laughs> the oh, rapture. okay, good. <laughs> I'm good. sorry. Because <laughs> you see, when, when you think about how the end times will unfold, I don't see how it can happen as long as Christians are around. Sure. Now, I know sure. there's going to be people saved during the tribulation. I understand that. But it'll be a small minority. In the meantime, here we are. There are Christians everywhere. There's conservative politicians all over the place. And in order for sin to go to its fullest extent, I believe the Spirit of God through the church has to be removed. Because as long as the church is here, we're preaching the gospel, people are getting saved, miracles are happening, manifestations are taking place, that has to cease because God's mercy is definitely running out. So I hope you all understand that. And by the way, let me just say this. There are some people who in the comments last week were criticizing me because we happen to believe in the rapture. Let me just say something. I don't want to hear your theological objections to what we teach here. We believe in the rapture. We believe there's a separation and there's a distinction between the church and tribulation saints. And if you want to go through the tribulation, that's fine with me. You can do it. But we believe in the rapture, and that's our approach here at this Bible study. And there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm not going to get into a theological debate in the comments section. And the next time I see somebody refuting us in that way, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to take off your comment. So please. Just be respectful, enjoy the Bible study, but understand we are a pre-trib rapture-believing church, okay? All right. 
So I had to say that because somebody wrote a nasty comment last week, which I didn't appreciate at all. So I had to address it. Okay, here's the second uh, mystery. This is the mystery of godliness. And without controversy, it says in 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Listen carefully to this. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up into glory. So what is the mystery of godliness? If you take all these things and put them together in one package, it's got to be the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit on the cross. He died for our sins, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and they got saved and received up in glory in a resurrected body. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last mystery I wanted to touch on was 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 51. Let me just put the S where it belongs. There we go. And this is the mystery of the resurrection of our bodies. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this mystery tells us that the kingdom of God will be inhabited by resurrected, embodied saints. We won't be floating around like ghosts. We will have indestructible, imperishable bodies. But I have a question. Why has it taken so many years, so many centuries, for God to reveal his full will to us? Why has it taken so long? Jeffrey, what do you think? Why has God taken so much time to establish the gospel of Jesus Christ and get people saved? Jeffrey. Um, question. I think it's just that God has a different time scale to us, and it has his purpose for taking his time in order to reveal things to us so we can, so we can understand it properly throughout ages. Okay, let me ask Lise. Lise, what do you think? Why did God take so long to establish the gospel and to bring Jesus into the world? Because of his great love for all people, and he wanted everyone to have an opportunity. So he did the pauses and takes a lot of time and just, oh. just is oh. giving people a chance to be able to get the message and receive it. Oh, okay. That's Thank you, think. Lise. That's You're a good welcome. one. Okay. What about you? Um, let's see. Stephen, what do you think? Why did God take so long to establish the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because he had to uh, convict Israel of sin. Yeah, right. After convicting them of sin, now he has to go and bring the Gentiles into the, into the family of God. The first he had to convict the Jew, the Israelite, that they are sinful, that they can obey the law. Uh, that he gave them so that by convicting them now he can reach out to the to the nations to the gentiles okay what about you judy what do you think why is god well, taking so long mine goes so along with steve but i think it's because he's merciful and yeah. he gave chances to israel over and over and over again to repent and come back to him Okay, so he gave chances to Israel to repent over and over again, but that establishes a couple of things. Number one, no one can follow the law. Nobody. We're all sinners condemned under the law. Number two, no matter what God does, if we don't have the Spirit of God living in us, which comes through salvation in Jesus Christ, we cannot obey the Lord. Everything comes from the Lord. New nature comes from the Lord. The death of the sin nature comes from the Lord. Everything we do in Christ comes from the Lord and his spirit in us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that took some time. It had to be established that the law was not capable of saving people. And that means that any religion that has laws or that teaches that men have to do something to earn God's favor are false religions. They don't work. The only thing that works is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. That's the only thing that will get us into heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Why? Because he went to the cross and eliminated all our, all our sins on the cross because he took them all upon himself. Well, that's good. Very good so far. Mm -hmm. Hope you're enjoying the Bible study because I am. All right. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. 
And so I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. Now, some speculate that John had seen so many judgments, so many overwhelming things that he was completely whacked out by the judgment he had seen, and that this little book was the word of God given to him to comfort his spirit, but also to give him the courage to continue to prophesy. Others believe that the book was a revelation in itself of the, of the judgments that were yet to come. But either way, the book that the angel had in his hand was the word of God. So the angel said to John, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book, John says, out of the angel's hands and ate it. And it was indeed as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And I thought to myself, that's not the first time that the word of God has been eaten by somebody because I remember that Ezekiel was told to eat a scroll that was sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. And Jeremiah also was given a scroll of the word of God, and he ate it as well. So my question is, why is the word sweet and bitter? Sweet and bitter. Okay, let's see. Joseph, what do you think? Why is the word of God sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach? What do you think that means? <laughs> Something to um... think about. Something to think of. For me, um, for me, I, I'm thinking. Of course, the word, the word of God, you yeah. know, is um, powerful, yeah. and it will reveal to us, in a way, those mysteries that we cannot understand in the beginning. Because, like God, when God is talking, uh, uh, when Jesus was here on earth. He spoke mainly in parables. And for those who um, who has been with him for the longest time, then they, they caught what Jesus was trying to say at that moment. But for the, um, uh, I call us, um, for, but for, for those that went, that were in the, in, in the synagogue, especially the, the Pharisees, to them, it was really a big mystery. And so, like, I'm looking at those who can understand the word because God on the Holy Spirit has revealed something to them. It will be sweet. But for those who oppose, who oppose God's word and and oppose Jesus as the Son of God, it will be bitter in, in, in effect. Okay. All right. What, a, what about you, Justin? What do you think makes the word of God sweet? Let's just stick with sweet. What makes the word of God sweet in your estimation? Justin. The good news. Oh, the good news. Okay, so tell me why that would be sweet. Salvation. Yeah, salvation, right. Because people know that they're saved, and that's good news. It makes them feel happy. And uh, let's see, John, what makes the word of God bitter? Well, it, it, it can be uh, uh, something that you want to hear that that makes uh, that that seems to be a wonderful thing but sometimes the word uh, can, can end up uh, end up uh, hurting and may not be the word of god so there's there's that relationship that that uh, that that good and 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 bad so there's a bad result you know we expected something that was tasted sweet immediately to to stay sweet you know I, and I, I don't know why that happens. It's just, uh, it's just. I think it, it's just uh, the word of God. It's, uh, it can prophesy, for example. You, you have prophecy. It seems to be a good thing, but then you have to go through a lot, just like we have to go through revelation. We have to go to what, what, what's happening uh, to the earth now. You know, yes, it's God's word, and it's wonderful because it's God's word. But we have to. We have. It's bitter because we have. We have to go through a lot to 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 uh, to go through it. What about you, Vivian? What do you think? What makes the word of God wor uh, sweet and then bitter? Um, it, the word word of God is uh, food to our spirit. Yeah, and um, it's sweet. Even just meditating, reading, going through the the. Taking time in the word of God, you have that 
it's that sweet to enjoy the word of God. It, it yeah. feeds your spirit, it gives life. Okay, so what makes it bitter? I'm thinking because um, this we will be condemned by the word of God. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Yeah, okay. There are some things that the word of God will convict us on. That's true. And if we go back to what John said, the word of God is sweet, easy to listen to, hard to live out. <laughs> hard yeah. to live out. Easy to listen to, wonderful. Hey, Jesus right. loves me. That's great. Jesus makes me his disciple. Jesus has given me a spirit. Now I got to walk in the spirit. Well, have a good time because it's going to be tough. That's, I guess that pretty well summarizes why the word of God is sweet and bitter. And here's a great, great couple of illustrations on the subject. There's the sweetness of God's word, honey dripping into a jar. <laughs> this baby, <laughs> this baby here makes me laugh because he's finding the word of God bitter. And uh, when it's uh, when it's challenging and when it's convicting, yeah, I guess that's how we would respond. So that's what makes the word of God sweet and bitter. All right, here we go to hey, Revelation chapter 11 at last. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. I want you to just take note of that last line, that the outer court is given to the Gentiles. Now, what is this temple? Is it Herod's temple? that's been destroyed by this time, by the time the book of Revelation was written? Is it the people of God and the number of those who are saved? Or is it an actual physical building, specifically the third temple of Israel, which is built either before or during the tribulation? And the reason I ask those questions, because these are the three different interpretation of these particular verses. Now, I believe this one. It's kind of obvious to me that this is a physical building. It's not the people of God. It's not Herod's temple. This is a temple that's going to be built during or before the tribulation. And they will tread the Holy Spirit, or they will, I'm sorry, they will tread the Holy City underfoot for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So two witnesses are established at the temple in Jerusalem to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the lost. These two witnesses are stationed not far from the temple, and they're given three and a half years, three and a half years, 1260 days, to preach the gospel in Israel. And perhaps, this is a speculation, that this is how the 144,000 of the tribes of Israel are sealed, through these people's testimony. Here's an artist's depiction of them, the two witnesses standing on the temple mountain calling down fire on those that uh, oppose them. And I find it interesting because this artist has put the two witnesses preaching just with uh, the Mosque of Omar and the Muslim artifacts in the background. Now, since the scripture says that the outer court of the future temple will be given to the Gentiles, it's possible, only possible, I'm not stating a dogma here, but it's possible that the temple will be built beside the Muslim holy places. Another possibility, and I've heard this one, is that the temple will be built as elsewhere, nowhere near the Muslim buildings. And the third possibility, which I think is more likely, is that the Muslim holy places will be destroyed, which will open up the Temple Mount. In fact, the whole future of Islam is at question here, because some believe that the Antichrist will be a Muslim caliph. But if you read Revelation chapter 13, the description of the beast, it doesn't sound to me from that description that he is a Muslim caliph. I believe that Islam is on the way out and that by the time of the tribulation, there won't be uh, any uh, any uh, real power or threat from Islam. But we'll find, about, we'll find out about this in the future. Now, by the time the two witnesses show up, the Antichrist is in power. But he doesn't do anything about the two witnesses. He lets them preach. Why? Because in the first three and a half years, of the tribulation, which is when these witnesses show up, he shows favor to the Jews. So it's believed that these events, the two witnesses, happen in the first half of the tribulation because the Antichrist does nothing against them. Now, the next question is, who are these witnesses? Well, the Bible says in verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, 
he must be killed in this manner, being burnt with fire. These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Well, these are some really powerful guys. Now, some believe that these two are Moses and Elijah because they work the same miracles that they did on earth. Water turning to blood, that's Moses. Fire coming from heaven, that's Elijah. Withholding the rain, that's also Elijah. Others conclude that this must be Elijah and Enoch, since they were the only two that went straight to heaven without dying. But I'm not sure that going straight to heaven without dying qualifies either of them to be one of the two witnesses. I think this is a God's choice. I really don't know if it's going to be Moses or Enoch or Eli I'm sure it's going to be Elijah, but I'm not sure about Enoch and Moses. And still others believe that they represent larger groups of witnesses, which is interesting, but it's not likely because when you read the following verses, it's quite obvious, quite clear. Does that say clear? My goodness, what a terrible job I did of spelling there. There we go. That's better. It's clear that these two are individuals. Watch this. And when they finish their testimony, the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit, uh, bottomless, I'm sorry, out of the bottomless, uh, bottomless pit and will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street. Pretty hard to kill a group. Uh, to, it's pretty hard to put to death a group of people. So they can't be a group of people. They have to be individuals because their two dead bodies will be laying in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Now, somewhere after the first three and a half years of the tribulation, a demon is coming out of the bottomless pit. And this demon probably personally possesses the Antichrist, who now is used by that demon to turn against the two witnesses and kill them in Jerusalem. How do I know it's Jerusalem? Because it says it's the city where Jesus was crucified. And that act initiates the second half of the tribulation period. Now, here's a couple of diagrams describing the Antichrist. I like this one better because the Antichrist is going to be a, a very a powerful and a very influential and a very attractive figure. And people will worship him because they he will bring all kinds of solutions to the problems that we're facing now. Economic problems, problems of war between nations. Everything is going to be solved by this one man. Of course, he'll be inspired by Satan. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So guess what, folks? It'll be Christmas again when these two guys are put to death. Why? Because they tormented the nations with their judgments and they drove the nations crazy with their gospel. But through their testimony, some will be saved. So again, God shows mercy. Now, after the three and a half days, or after three and a half days, the breath of God enters them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Interesting. Here's an artist's depiction of that right here. There's the two witnesses being taken into heaven before witnesses on earth. What happens as a result? In that same hour, at the time when the two witnesses are ascended into heaven, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid. And what happened? They gave glory to the God of heaven. So this event causes some people to be saved. Wonderful. The mercy of God is working. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And I thought it would be good to review the woes. So here's the first one. This is from Revelation 9-2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. That's woe number one. Here's the second woe from Revelation 11-13. And the same hour was there was a great earthquake, and the tenth of the part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the third woe is coming up. Here it is. 
Revelation eleven nineteen, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightnings and voices, thunderings and an earthquake, and great hail. That's only a partial description of the third woe. Here's the third woe in full, starting at verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In other words, the final verdict on the world is cast. There's no turning back now. The judgment is coming. And the Lord will have his way and establish his kingdom. Verse 16, the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O God Almighty, the one who was and was and the one who is to come the one who is and who was and is to come, because you have taken your great power and you have reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple, and there were lightnings and noises and thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. And that's just the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet introduces another pause where we talk about the Antichrist, we talk about mystery Babylon, we talk about uh, a woman with uh, 12 stars around her head, we find out about the nation of Israel, we find out about Christ, we find out about the devil and his attack on the church and the people of God. And then in the seven bowls begin after that, and then God's judgment really rains down on the earth. And thank God we're not going to be part of it. So that's it for this Bible study. I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. And I'm going to ask Stephen to close in prayer. Stephen. Dear Father, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful message, uh, teaching that we have received today, we have increased, O oh Lord, the knowledge of what is going to happen in the future, O oh Lord. Thank you for staring in us this urgency to preach your word. Many may be saved and that they do not face the judgment that is coming to the world. But I thank you for your word because it is also a word of comfort. It is sweet to our taste. Thank you, Father. And we don't want it to be bitter to those who face your judgment. So we're going to preach over it. I pray, Father, that you bless Pastor Alex and you continue to reveal more of your word and uh, to bless him abundantly. Oh Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are present here in Zoom, that you protect them, that you guide them, that you bless them and that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be wonderful in their life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Just before we go, I'd ask you for a prayer for my ears. The reason I have earphones on is because yesterday my left ear blocked completely. I couldn't hear a thing out of it. And I went to the doctor today and they flushed out both my ears, but now my right ear is blocked. My left ear is okay. And I'd like prayer for our ears to just clear up and I don't have to use these headphones anymore because it's very difficult to speak and to hear you with the headphones. But other than that, God bless you and thank you for coming. Don't forget to pray for me. Bye-bye. Thank God you. Bless Bye. You. God bless you, Pastor. Bye.